Okay, hey everybody, Chris Shoup here, and I am super honored today to have Tim Level on. Tim is the uh, author of a variety of excellent travel books and has been published on just about every platform imaginable. Every, uh, every publication um, has written articles and has appeared as a travel expert. So welcome, Tim. Hey, thanks for having me on. Good to talk to you. Yeah, good to talk to you. Um, so uh, you, you said that you're in Mexico City now, right? Not the city, but uh, about four hours north of there. I live in a city called Guanajuato, which is um, a UNESCO World Heritage City. It's a, you know, an old historic colonial city up in the mountains. So I'm kind of like you. I've got one of those eternal spring client spring climates, although it does get a little chillier like in January and February, but it, we're at 6,000 feet, so it's pretty nice. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, so for, for someone who doesn't know what you mean by eternal spring climates, what, what is that? <laughs> well, just that the temperature doesn't vary all that much, especially during the day, and I think Medellin's a whole lot like that. So sometimes here it gets kind of cold at night in um, the winter months, but when you when the sun comes up and you know you go out and for a walk at eleven o'clock or twelve o'clock, it's going to be seventy five or eighty again. And so um, it's sunny most of the time and um, it doesn't get super hot either, like it does if you're on the coast of Mexico or if you're in Merida or someplace like that where it can get really steamy a few months of the year. And you know, yeah. uh, you and I both lived in Tampa, uh, Florida, and it can get a bit hot and humid there for a few months for sure yeah tampa's really hot in the summer yeah that's something that, that blew my mind when i first recognized that it that that even existed that there are climates that are the same year round and they're like beautiful weather all the time <laughs> so yeah that's one of the benefits of, of being a digital nomad is i like to say is that you don't ever have to deal with bad weather pretty much yeah, you can pick your your ultimate climate. You know, some people really like having all four seasons and they want to be able to go skiing in the winter and, and there's nothing wrong with that. But um, other people don't want to be where it's cold anymore so they can move. And, and mm -hmm. some people just want to be in the tropics and they want to be at a beach and have palm trees all the time. And if you're a nomadic, you can just pick pick your ideal place. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So what else? What else attracted you about that uh, that town in Mexico apart from the nice weather? It's a very pedestrian friendly city, so that was important to me. I didn't want to have a car if I could avoid it, and it's pretty easy to not have one here. I can walk almost everywhere I need to go because it's fairly compact. It's like a lot of old historic cities; everything's kind of close together, you know. So you don't have to walk for miles and miles to get somewhere. And when I do have to take a taxi, it's three dollars you know somewhere in there yeah, yeah. so uh, it's it's not going to kill me to uh take a cab to the other side of town if it's late at night or whatever or i'm carrying groceries but um it's also kind of a curvy place which is unusual in in colonial cities usually they're kind of set out on a grid you know but this one because it's in a river valley it's it's got a lot of uh curves to it and it's kind of unique in that sense and so the houses kind of spill down the sides of the hill, so everybody's got a good view. Oh, that's awesome. Sounds like a nice place. And it's got so, good air air connections, too. i got to mention that because really? uh, if you're wanting to get back to the States for business reasons or to see family or whatever, it's kind of nice to live in a place where you can always know you can hop on a plane and get home if you need to. And that's that's because we're near... Uh, a city where there's a lot of um, business going on called Leon and there's car factories and shoe factories and things like that. So United, Delta and American all fly in here. So that's kind of a nice thing too. If I want to go somewhere, I can get out of here pretty quickly and get to another part of the world. Yeah, for sure. That's important. So uh, what what's the cost of living like there? You said it's $3 for a taxi. Probably everything's pretty cheap. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's, it might even be cheaper than Colombia in some aspects. Um, food's relatively cheap here. You can go out for a, a meal of the day for, you know, three or four dollars and get a few courses or you can get, uh, you know, a huge plate of tacos or 
something like that. Um, and you know, if you go to a nice place, it's really hard to spend more than twenty dollars each unless you're really drinking a lot. <laughs> and so yeah. that's yeah. that's kind of good. And uh, I just paid my electric bill, which was ten dollars, because that kind of goes back to the climate oh. too. No, uh, okay. no air conditioning, yeah. but. Um, yeah. And and the big thing though is this kind of filters into everything else, but uh, the cost of labor is fairly low, and so that can affect how much you pay to get your house cleaned, how much you pay to get your, you know, your pants hemmed, <laughs> you know, anything that, that requires labor. And back to the taxi thing too, or taking a bus is, uh, it's about thirty cents to take a public bus here, and so those wow. kinds of things make life a lot easier. Um, when you're, you know, when your bills go down across the board, it it makes things a lot easier. Yeah, if you're a gringo, uh, digital nomad, making a gringo salary, paying the paying the local prices, it's it's pretty nice. Yeah, Money and I way. I think most of the friends I have that rent a place here pay somewhere between, like I'd say three fifty three hundred fifty dollars to maybe six or seven hundred dollars a month if they've got a pretty big and nice place. Um, I own my house here now, so I don't have a, I have rent, but when I did rent here one time with my whole family, um, we paid $800 a month, including all utilities. And that was four bedrooms and two baths. And I think oh, wow. we probably could have found a better deal if we really, really looked around. But the point is if we tried to do that, uh, in a mid-sized city in America, it would be, you know, a whole lot more than that. Definitely more than double. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, how how long have you been uh, location independent? When was when was the first time that you were able to to leave the typical office job? Yeah, it's kind of funny because I backpacked around the world when I was younger for three oh. years, um, and my wife and I before we ever had a kid, and we taught English along the way. And but really, we were living off savings. Like I was doing some travel writing. And we made money teaching English. And one year we were on a real contract and we were like full-time workers. But um, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't count myself as location independent then because we still had a lot of money in the bank that we were living off of. But maybe yeah. like for the last 12 years, I've been at a point, 13 years maybe, where I was making enough for my business that uh, I was supporting a family and we didn't really have to live in one place. It was more that we did for a while in the States because I had a daughter in school and that always complicates things. So basically, we went back and forth between Mexico and the U.S. a few times. So my daughter went to school in Mexico for three years in Spanish. So she's really fluent, um, which I can't say the same for myself, but <laughs> yeah. she's uh, she's really good in Spanish. Um so she went to school here for three years and then we went back to the States for three years so she could finish um, and get her high school diploma. So now I'm truly location independent because I don't have to worry about school schedules. But um, anyway, I could have gone any time if we uh, didn't have the the uh, family dynamic and the school things to worry about. Yeah, I got you. That's amazing. I, I've heard some people will... Uh... There's this movement called unschooling, where some people take their kids around the world with them. Yeah, yeah. Not um, sure what I think of that. <laughs> I mean, it could work. It's not like our education system is so great. It's not great anywhere, to be honest. Like we're still sort of stuck in this rut while we're that we're uh, you know doing way too much memorization and standard standardized tests and all that. So there is something to be said for blowing all that up and uh, trying a different path. But it also takes a certain kind of parent to homeschool your kids, I think. And you've got to have a lot of patience and a really good relationship. And you got to be willing to, you know, level yourself up while you're uh, teaching them high school level courses, especially. You got to uh, you got to really know your stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> my, my parents homeschooled me for a few years when I was a kid and they uh they and some of them will, will do like a co-op where they'll uh, you know if one of them's good at math they'll be the math teacher and the other ones that are good at English will do be the English teacher etc. I just wonder if it's if it's if the kids like doing the nomad thing or if they uh, if they rather you know settle down somewhere. But I don't have any kids of my own, so I haven't had to worry about that. Yeah, it is a concern though I think because um, 
like the kids really care about their friends at that age, you know, and the older they get, the more important it is. So if you're just on the move all the time and they don't get to make any real relationships, I think that's the hard part. Yeah, that's that would be my worry if I was going to look into that. I think it'd be better to have a base at least that you come back to over and over again. Yeah, I think so. Uh, so what did you do before before you uh, started traveling, before you before you did the whole nomad thing? Do you have a regular office job or what? Yeah, I did. I've had a regular office job at two different times. But when I got out of college, I, um, I had studied music and business. And I went to work in the music business for uh, a record company when they used to call them record companies, but music company. I worked for RCA Records and um, oh, I did that. Yeah, it was a fun job. It was loads of fun. And I worked in Nashville and New York City. And I met my um, girlfriend in New York City. And eventually she became my wife. But we went traveling around the world together for a year and didn't kill each other. So then we got married. <laughs> so, uh, but I, I had not traveled all that much before that. I was doing the corporate job, trying to work my way up the ladder and, you know, doing all those things people taught you to do, you know, getting promotions and buying a prop, buying a place to live and all that kind of stuff, having a car. But then yeah. we went, then we went traveling with backpacks and I realized, oh yeah, you don't really need all that stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's and then, what, so I did that for seven years before we went backpacking around the world. So I definitely knew what the, the corporate uh, showing up every day stuff was like. Yeah, for sure. So that's what motivated you to to escape. That you did a little bit traveling, you know, on savings, and then you <laughs> you realize that that uh, you could do that full time. Yeah, it happens with a lot of people. I think they try to they go traveling around the world just as backpackers, as long term travelers, and then they start thinking, "Wow, this is a lot more exciting than what I was doing before." And they try to figure out a way to keep doing it. You know, so they find a way to. Um, create some kind of location independent business or be a freelancer, a remote worker, whatever they can do to kind of keep that lifestyle going. Yeah, for sure. And it's it's pretty affordable. I think this is something that's surprising, especially for Americans. We think of travel as this big luxury, but really, um, if you know how to do it, it, you can it costs it costs more to not travel than to travel. That's what I like to say. Yeah, I, I think we've all run into that as we talk to people back home and they can't believe what we're spending. They think we're lying or yeah. that we're, we're we're living in dirt floor places, you know, with candlelight or something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's uh, you can you can easily go traveling around the world almost anywhere for let's just say for the sake of argument, a thousand to two thousand dollars a month. Well, there's no way you can live on that in a decent sized city in the US or Canada or United Kingdom, but you can easily travel on that almost indefinitely. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So how did you uh, how did you manage to uh, when you when you made your escape, how did you manage to fund that? You, you said you were living on savings for a while, but eventually you must have had had to come up with an income source. What was that? Yeah, so I did actually go back to an office job for a while because I was, um, we were getting ready to have a baby and I knew I had to like have some steady income, but I kept yeah. travel writing the whole time. So basically I was working for this tech company um, uh, managing a proposal writing group. So we would we would write sales proposals for, um, you know, the guys going out and pitching deals for these software deals. So it wasn't very exciting from a uh, creative standpoint, but the money was pretty good because it was a tech company. So, you know, I was I was banking money and I honestly wasn't working all that hard. So I would come home nights and weekends and keep doing the travel writing stuff. And that's when I put out the first edition of um, the world's cheapest destinations book. And um, that's, you know, that's sold fairly well. And I started getting some press and I started the blog. And so then it just kind of built up for there from there. But basically, the internet came along and made it a lot easier to be a publisher, to have control over your own output. Whereas in the past, I was just writing for magazines, you know, doing freelance writing, and the money was very, you know, up and down. And um, I gotcha. so 
I started making, it was basically a side hustle, you know, I started making more money and more money from this side job. And eventually I reached a point where it was like, okay, I can make this a full-time job now, but I definitely did not go running off the cliff. <laughs> you know, I got there gradually yeah. over a few years. I see what you mean. Uh, so there's, I, I know that a lot of people are, uh, would like to make it as writers these days and they would, they would kill for the opportunity to do what you're doing. What, uh, what, what do you think in 2019, what do you think that people who would like to make a living writing, what do you think that they should do? How should they go about that? Well, I think if you're going to start a blog, which is a pretty easy thing to do, um, and it makes a lot of sense over the long term, you got to understand that it's going to take a few years before it starts generating an income. So again, back to that don't go running off a cliff thing. <laughs> yeah. It's better if you can start it while you're doing something else and then build it up over time. Um, even if you do everything right, perfectly right, it's going to take you two or three years because it just takes Google that long to take you seriously and for people to link to you and your social media profiles to build up and all that stuff. Um, the other part of it is, you know, pick something that's different that nobody else is doing. And that's, of course, harder and harder as time goes on. But if you try to just do a general travel blog, like here I am traveling around the world, isn't this great? Mm -hmm. um, it's it's tough to to make it doing that because there are so many thousands of blogs already out there that are similar. And so try to figure out what you're really, really passionate about or what you could write 500 blog posts about without getting bored, you know, because yeah. uh, if you don't have that excitement about it, then you're going to burn out and get sick of it after a while because it's kind of a grind like anything else. You got to be putting out content on a regular basis. And if you're a vlogger, it's even worse. Like if you're a YouTuber, you got to be putting out stuff, you know, every day or two, or you're going to start dropping down the algorithms. You don't have to do it that much with writing, but you do have to put out stuff on a semi-regular basis at least. Um, so in the meantime, you know, other things you can be doing to make money besides having a regular job are you can try to do freelance articles, you know, find um, websites that you can hook up with. There's still some print outlets that welcome new writers, but um, those kind of things you're going to get paid faster. So anything you can find to do remotely that doesn't make you have to depend on your own business is going to help immensely because it can keep some cash flow going while you're getting your blog started. Yeah, I agree with that for sure. How do you uh, how do you find an audience? Well, the first thing is uh, try to write about something that other people are excited about too. So uh, it kind of goes back to that niche thing. Um, I've at this point run six sites over the years and I, I sold one of them a few years back. So I kind of figured out over time that if you're writing about something very specific that people care about a lot, you're going to do better than if you're trying to be super broad. Even if you don't have as big an audience, there'll be an audience that cares. And so it's easier for you to keep them coming back and it's easier for you to sell them things down the line, you know, to put affiliate links in your posts where if somebody buys something, you get a commission. And, and then obviously the more traffic you get and the more engaged it is, the easier it is to, to run advertising on your site and make some money from it. So, um, but how do you build an audience? Well, you just got to find the right people that care about that subject and answer their questions, help them out, give them advice. So, um, you know, social media matters, search matters a lot. That's going to be your main source of traffic eventually. Um, you know, I, if you could build up an email list from the very beginning, that's more important than social media even because emails get opened at a much higher percentage rate than tweets do, <laughs> for instance. Yeah. So, um, you know, try to try to build a real dialogue with those people. And it, there's a if you just Google this, there's an article called A Thousand True Fans from um, Kevin Kelly, who was the, f the original founder of Wired magazine. And the, the real concept of that is whether you're a musician or a book author or blogger or whatever, if you've got a thousand people who really care, that's more valuable than having, you know, 10 or 20,000 people that stop by once a year and don't really have much interest. <laughs> so yeah. uh, definitely try to cultivate those people that are um, excited about whatever the subject is. 
Yeah, good stuff. Thank you. Um, what about uh, you're you're also a published author? You've written what's it, four or five books now? Yeah, I have five, and I sort of just keep updating them. So I haven't yes. broken new ground for a while, but. Um, the last one I did was called A Better Life for Half the Price, and that was about living abroad, and that's the one that's done the best. Um, I saw although, that. That's a great title. I love the title. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. And uh, it, it obviously didn't hurt me when um, the angry, angry orange one got elected in the U.S. either. It, so I sort of saw a spike in sales after that, and it stayed higher because I think a lot of people kind of wanted to get out after that. Um, but, you know... I, I am going to have to update it next year, I think, because it's about four or five years old now and people start looking at the copyright date, even though things haven't really changed very much. So um, I do kind of have to periodically put new versions out. But the the main point of that was, yeah, looking at the economic part of it, you know, how much better you can live somewhere else, how much you can extend your runway if you're trying to start a business. I mean, if you're going to go... Um, live in New York City and try to start a blog, it's going to be really tough. But if you live in Chiang Mai and try to start some, you know, remote mm -hmm. business or Medellin or where I'm living in Mexico, it's a whole lot easier and life's a lot more stressful, a lot less stressful. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So uh, how how would you recommend somebody go about it? Well, should um, Somebody who's a novice writer, does it even make sense to write a book, or does it? You think that it maybe uh, maybe they should try blogging for a few years, gain a following, and then write a book? Yeah, I would do it in that order. I, I think it's preferable because I, I have to admit I put out my first one, the world's cheapest destinations, before I put out the blog actually, but that's because nobody had a blog back then. <laughs> this was uh, I'm talking yeah. like 15 years ago when I put out the first edition. Now I'm just finishing up the fifth one, but. Um, yeah, I mean, the reason for that is once you've run a blog for a while, you know which which subjects and which posts are really popular and which ones get comments and that resonate with people and get shared. And so then you got a much better sense of what people really care about as opposed to if you write the book first and float it out there, you're not going to get much feedback except for maybe a few Amazon reviews. And it's harder to tell whether it's resonating with people or not, whether... Whereas with a blog and social media, you're getting instant feedback. And so that's really valuable, I think. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And then the Do second part of that is you're an expert too, you know, like you already know a lot about it. So then when you put out the book, you you sound like you know what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, yeah, that helps. <laughs> Do you get most of your sales through Amazon or uh, through other platforms? Yeah, mostly through Amazon. I get some through... Uh, Apple and Kobo and, um, you know, things like that. And I, and one of, you know, I do sell some packages on my own, like through my own website. Um, cause then I can sell other things along with it, like consulting services or whatever. But yeah, Amazon is just the giant beast. I think they have like 70% of the market or something in the U S. So, um, yeah. I mean, if you're, if you're successful on there, you're going to be successful, you know, I mean, there's some kinds of books where you really, are probably going to sell more in bookstores like you know if it's some coffee table book or even guidebooks it still matters to be in stores but mm -hmm. i think for for a lot of things these days i mean you when's the last time you went in a book and went in the bookstore and bought something you know it's just not as common as it used to be yeah yeah that's true all right do you get most of your sales through uh, through kindle or are you, you still selling physical books too yeah, it's still about half and half, honestly. I mean, some books more than others, but um, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm kind of surprised. The mix for the last two or three years has stayed pretty much the same, and I think that's because it's not an either-or thing, you know. A lot of people will read a book at home, a physical book at home, and then if they're going traveling for three weeks, they'll take their Kindle with them just because it's way more convenient. <laughs> you can, yeah. you can yeah, load up. Sure. Sure. And load up eight books on there but it still is nice you know to hold a physical book and when you're laying in bed you know with the light on um it just depends so i don't think it's yeah. necessarily i don't think it's necessarily like people thought that physical books were going to die and i don't i don't think that's the case but 
ebooks are they do have a lot of advantages that's for sure especially because you can get them instantly you know like if you yeah. finish a book it's and nice. you're in you finish a book and you're in bogota and you want a new one and you just you know click a few buttons and you've got a new book yeah <laughs> yeah exactly i i buy a lot of kindle books these days um if there is one thing that you know now that you wish you had known when you started when you started this whole uh, travel adventure, what would that be? Um, yeah, <laughs> two things really. First of all, you got to know that you're going to have to adapt and change a lot. Like I don't think I realized how much the business of travel writing would change. Like when I first started out, uh, I was just mostly sending in text in Word documents, and that was my job, you know. But now you have to be a fairly good photographer, and you got to know how to edit your photos, and you got to do video, and you got to write in a different way for a magazine than you would write for a, a blog just because it's a different style. But then there's all the back end stuff, you know. If you, if you run a WordPress blog, there's a lot of stuff you got to learn that's just kind of techie stuff that you would think you'd never have to deal with, but you do. <laughs> so um, oh, yeah. you got to wear a lot of hats. And I think a lot of people aren't ready for that. Um, and the other thing is that I'm a really patient guy, but I didn't realize how long it would take to get a new site going and to get traction on it. Like I, I was starting things like every year or two for a while there. And mm -hmm. you think, oh, it's the internet. It's going to happen instantly. But no, <laughs> just because it's the internet doesn't mean things move any faster. And so you got to really be prepared to grind it out for years on end sometimes before you really start feeling like you're making serious progress. It's definitely, um, you know, uh, a long slog for a while there. And yeah. everybody goes through that. It's not like, it's not like um, that's a unique thing that you're going to deal with and you should think you're a failure. It's like, Everybody who's famous now still went through that for two years. Yeah, yeah. Every success looks like a failure in the middle, right? <laughs> exactly, <laughs> yeah. That's recently. Now, we're talking about writing. I mean, there are things that happen faster. If you start an Amazon business where you're drop shipping physical products to people, you know, you might be able to get that rolling in six months. Or if you're uh, somebody that that already as a systems analyst or you're already a um you know a graphic artist or a web designer or something you just want to go location independent then you might be able to do that a lot quicker because you've already got a skill set and you've already got contacts but i'm just talking about how fast google works and how fast social media works if you're not buying your way in and, and taking shortcuts yeah yeah that's how i started was uh <laughs> Working, doing IT stuff, which IT stuff is awesome if you want to do the digital nomad thing. Yeah, sure. But yeah, for sure. A lot of people like to do the writing too. Um, what's uh, what are you working on right now? Any any new projects in the works or uh, revisions to old projects? <laughs> yeah, so I'm I'm finishing up the fifth edition of the world's cheapest destinations, and it's always really hard when you're working on a book and you're trying to run the rest of your life and your business as well because. You know, you really have to have hours and hours of time when you're not doing anything else. And it's kind of hard <laughs> to carve out that time. But I'm almost I'm on the home stretch of that. But otherwise, um, yeah, I, I put out a few blog posts every week on various sites. And so I feel like a lot of times I'm just kind of doing the same thing each week when I'm not traveling. And then the other thing is um, I'm going back and revising old posts and doing a lot of updating because um, the longer you have your blog, the more out of date posts you have <laughs> and uh, oh yeah that's true it's like yeah. uh it's like a big cleanup job it's like going through your attic and realizing how much crap you have that you know you shouldn't be hanging on to anymore yeah. so yeah that's a big job as well so do you actually go and actually and change the post or do you do you write a new one and like link to the new one saying here are the updates for 2019 yeah either or sometimes i'll just um well, a few things. I'll either completely delete the old post and just redirect to the home page or redirect to, you know, a category or something. Um, mm -hmm. But and then sometimes I'll create a whole new post and then link from the old one to the new one, redirect. But more often, I think what most people do is 
they'll either go back and combine a few posts or they'll just completely revamp and expand on the old one and make it more relevant. Um, I mean, you got to understand like 10 years ago when people were blogging, they were doing much shorter posts and half the time there wasn't even a photo in it, you know, and you would, uh, it was real, I think more common to talk about um, the news of the day, you know, whatever was current. And then we started to all realize that, oh, that's not very smart from a search standpoint. You should probably be doing more evergreen kind of things because those last a lot longer. So uh, a lot of things I put up 10 years ago were, you know, they were relevant 10 years ago and they're completely irrelevant now. <laughs> <laughs> like, like what? Can you give me an example? I'm curious. Well, yeah, sometimes they're news oriented things where it's, um, you know, talking about safety and referencing certain terrorist attacks or just talking about oh, yeah. what what tools were out there, like the, you know, the tools and the apps and the websites and whatever, those get out of date <laughs> pretty quickly sometimes. Yeah, yeah. So you're recommending websites to go to and tools to use, and they're just uh, ancient now, you know, because uh, we've got better things. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, that, that's uh, I resonate with the safety thing because, you know, I tell people uh, I'm in Medellin, Colombia, which is, you know, to most Americans' mind, that's the center of all the drug activity. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it hasn't been that way for like 20 years now. Yeah, you got to remind them that uh, narcos took t place in the 70s and early 80s. It's a different world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was a great show, though. <laughs> oh, it's awesome. I love that show. Yeah. The Mexico was great too. I'm, you know, I'm here in Mexico. And it was great to watch how that un, all unfolded, and um, you know, and there's there's crap that goes on all the time for sure. But mostly, if you're not in the wrong place at the wrong time, you're going to be okay. Yeah, yeah. It's the the Mexico uh, situation is more current, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's still it is bad here in some areas for sure, and there's a lot, but it's. It's a similar kind of situation in the sense that it's um, it's like the inner cities in the U.S. too. You know, it's like most of the violence that happens is gang related, and and here it's yeah. cartel related. But it's the same kind of thing. Like, you know, when you hear about six people beheaded, it's not tourists walking around Cancun. You know, <laughs> it's uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's some kind of turf battle, and so um, it is bad. I don't want to you know act like there's nothing going on, but um, but I've been here for years and years and I have personally not witnessed anything like that. And I, I, in a lot of ways, I feel safer in Mexico than I did in the U S just because normal people don't have guns. I mean, there are guns around, but you don't have these weird, you know, sh shootout massacre things like you do at movie theaters and concerts and nightclubs that you do in the U S usually if that kind of thing happens, <laughs> If that kind of thing happens, it was because there was a gang hit somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Well, there was just a school shooting in Brazil a few days ago. I think Yeah. they have those around the world. We just don't seem to hear about it. Much. We, I think the attitude in the U.S. is, oh, that's a third world country. That kind of thing happens all the time. So it, do, it doesn't even make our news, unfortunately. Yeah, but it doesn't happen. Not that I really want to hear about more of that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I mean... I, I think the news everywhere is kind of uh, sensationalist because that gets good ratings and gets people paying attention. But I think in some ways it's worse in the in the U.S. because we have four 24-hour channels that have to fill up their time. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have the local news, which is always like, if it bleeds, it leads. <laughs> and so they're going to make things as bad as make things look terrible also. <laughs> Yeah, get a pretty negative outlook on life if you watch the news too much. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's been studies on that. People that watch the news frequently are more depressed and they're more anxious and they think the world's a more dangerous place because that's what they're hearing all the time. Yeah, yeah, I believe it. Well, we're getting to the end of our half hour here. Um, if, uh, if listeners want to learn more about you, they want to follow you, uh, they want to check out your books, where, where should they go? So my main blog is the Cheapest Destinations blog. Um, I am the only writer on there, so that's me spouting off all the time. But if you also uh, search my name, it's just Tim Luffel, T-I-M, 
L-E-F-F-E-L. I've got a portfolio site, timleffel.com, and that links out to all the sites I run and the articles um, that I've written and some awards and media appearances and that kind of stuff. So you can find me there. And um, yeah, there's not many people with my name, thankfully. So if you Google my name, <laughs> you'll find stuff about me. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for, uh, for coming on, speaking to us. I'm sure that would be helpful for a lot of people. Yeah, thanks for having me. And, um, you know, uh, if anybody out there is just thinking about this life, there's a lot of advice out there. A lot of it's free or you can pay a little bit more and get better <laughs> advice. But um, yeah. a lot of people have gone down this path. So don't think it's some crazy thing you can't pull off. Um, thousands and thousands have gone before you. So it's just a matter of uh, getting some good advice and then starting to make plans. Yeah, absolutely. Well, good advice. Thanks a lot, Tim. Sure. Good talking to you and uh, have a good rest of the week.